Al Jazeera podcast. Indigenous activist Leonard Peltier has been in a U.S. maximum security prison for nearly five decades. But Nick Tilson is one of the few people able to speak with Leonard. Yeah, so I got to talk, I actually talked to Leonard last night. You know, he's, um, he wants to be free. The U.S. government says Leonard Peltier aided in the murder of two FBI agents. But over the years, problems with his trial, allegations of false evidence and coerced testimony have also appeared. The only thing I'm guilty of is trying to help my people. That's the only thing I'm guilty of. Since then, the UN, Amnesty International, U.S. senators, his former prosecutor, and many other activists, Native and non-Native, have spent the last decades advocating for his release. Leonard Peltier is known to many as the U.S.'s longest-serving political prisoner. And as the United States marks Indigenous Peoples Day, his supporters ask, why justice has been denied for so long. I'm Malika Bilal, and this is The Take. Today, I'm speaking with the head of one of the groups that is advocating for Leonard Peltier's release. My name is uh, Nick Tilson, and I'm the president and CEO of NDN Collective which is an organization, international organization dedicated to building indigenous power. And I'm Oglala Lakota, which is my tribe out here from the Oglala Lakota nation and from the lands of the Osheti Shakoi. And where am I catching you today? Where are you? I am in Mini Luzaha, which means Swift Water, also known as Rapid City, South Dakota. So... When did you first remember hearing the name Leonard Peltier? Oh, I first remember hearing the name Leonard Peltier probably at the time that I first was able to start remembering any names. My grandfather, Ken Tilson, was one of the attorneys, and my family was involved, and my father and mother were like legal organizers. I heard his name as one of our warriors and people that was locked up by the United States government. I think I really started understanding, I would say around age seven, seven or eight, his story was so consistent with um, how we were treated. The United States government has broken almost every promise it's ever made with Indian people. And so as shocking as his story is to so many people, it's also a reminder of how native people, indigenous people are treated every day by the United States government. Peltier was an activist with AIM, the American Indian Movement. How did he get involved? What was the draw? Leonard Peltier was a survivor of boarding schools. The U.S. government forcibly separated an estimated 100,000 children from their parents. Those who created it back in the mid-1800s called it the Federal Indian Boarding School System. But perhaps it should have been called an instrument of American genocide. He was a survivor of the government-sanctioned boarding schools and the church ranch boarding schools where they forced Native American people to assimilate into American society, to learn the Christian ways, to cut their hair out, to force them to wash their mouth out with soap if they were to speak their language, and then took them from their familial structures. And so Leonard Peltier, at a young age, was a survivor of the boarding school era, as many members of the American Indian movement were. And when the American Indian movement, you know, was started preaching pride, of your Indian ways and growing your long hair. I mean, that was a pull. He didn't want to have his culture beat out of him. He was proud of who he was. And so naturally, as the American and new movement started growing and building cultural pride um, of, of identity, then the American Indian movement started making political stances, treaty stances, fishing rights. Those things spoke to him and to many people who became members of the American Indian movement. So not everyone listening will be 
familiar with the story of Leonard Peltier, which we're going to begin 50 years ago, when Indigenous activists took over a town on a Native American reservation in Pine Ridge, South Dakota. What happened at Wounded Knee in 1973? I want to stall there because I, uh, it in fact was not a takeover. Um, I think that people have to understand the political and social context of the time. Mm. The American Indian Movement was started in 1968, and between 1968 and 1978, the American Indian Movement changed the political landscape for Indigenous rights in the United States. From the frustrations of Indian life was eventually born a movement dedicated to ending them, the American Indian Movement. It first claimed public attention by occupying the island of Alcatraz, More short-lived, but also more dramatic, was the American Indian Movement's protest at the Bureau of Indian Affairs building in Washington. Nick says AIM occupied the Bureau of Indian Affairs because they were seen as mismanaging their responsibility to the Native people. And for him, that hit close to home. The United States government decided that they were going to wage war against the American Indian Movement and that the battleground for that war was going to be my own community on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation. The Pine Ridge Reservation was under the Bureau of Indian Affairs, and many residents accused the reservation leader of a campaign of corruption and violence. So they invited AIM members to the reservation to help. And Nick says the U.S. government responded. So they had begun to do what they have done in many countries around the world, which was arm one side of the struggle. They, meaning the United States government, the FBI, backed the tribal government at the time. They packed a, a group of people called the goons, the guardians of the Wallala Nation, who were basically a paramilitary goon squad. And Pine Ridge had become a militarized zone at the time. So we have the local residents, the goon squad, the FBI, and the American Indian movement all there. It's a tinderbox ready to blow. In the winter of 1973, U.S. government agencies get word that something was happening. And so the story that some activists, you know, took over this small village, in fact, is not the actual case. People thought that the American Indian Movement was going to go to the tribal headquarters and ramsack the tribal headquarters, but they, in fact, just drove right by there. And they went to Wounded Knee to do a ceremony there. And when they got to Wounded Knee, they were then surrounded by the United States Marshals, the FBI, the goons, the tribal police, um, several different agencies. So it was much more of a siege Mm. than it was a takeover. And that struggle uh, or the siege at Wounded Knee became an international symbol of indigenous rights. You know, at that time, the nation was at a crossroads, right? The thing that people have to understand is that, like, the context of that is that the federal government engaged in a counterintelligence program, a counterintelligence strategy to dismantle the American Indian movement in the same way that they were trying to do to the civil rights movement, in the same way that they were trying to do to the Black Panther Party, at the same time they were trying to do La Raza, uh, at the same time they were doing to try to do many of these social movements at the time. Leonard Peltier, as part of the American Indian movement, wanted to help at Pine Ridge. Many Native Americans did at that time. Because even after the siege itself ended, the tensions at Pine Ridge continued. Between 1973, when Wundi ended, to about 1976, it was considered the reign of terror on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation, where there's over 60 plus murders. Many of those are the vast majority of those murders uh, were murders of Native people associated with the American Indian movement. And so you have this militarized zone, right? Like in 1975, there was all kinds of military and police at the time. And there was an encampment and two FBI agents followed a vehicle into this encampment that was women and children and members of the American Indian Movement supposedly to interrogate 
this person for the stealing of a set of cowboy boots. Hmm. Leonard was at that encampment. There's two FBI agents followed it, you know, in this climate where people are being murdered by the government and then a shootout in, ensued between people in the encampment and the FBI agents. And on that day, there was three people that were killed. Hmm. There was Kohler and Williams who were at the FBI agents and then there was Joe Stunts, who was a Native American person that was a member of that encampment. People figured, oh, they're gonna bring in the military, just gonna kill everybody. And so people fled for, for the right reasons. And at that time, the United States government launched the biggest manhunt in the history of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. They picked up Dino Butler and Bob Robidoux and charged them and then Leonard Paltier had escaped to Canada. And so on that day, you know, people felt like that was like, you know, the end of the world for a lot of folks because they figured that they were going to, you know, come in and, and kill everybody. So that's what happened on that day. After the break, how that manhunt ended, what happened at Leonard Peltier's trial, and what he's hoping for now. So, Nick, after the shootout, Leonard Peltier was charged and indicted for the murder of two FBI agents. Now, Amnesty International and the United Nations have both raised issues about the trial, and he's now been referred to as the United States' longest-serving political prisoner. What happened at the trial that makes so many people doubtful of his conviction? Well, a number of different things. The FBI coerced a witness in order to extradite him from Canada. They, they brought this witness in who was a poor bear, that was her last name, and interrogated her for hours and hours and hours until they finally had a signed affidavit from her that said that she was Leonard's uh, girlfriend and that he, in fact, told her that, that he committed the murders and killed those two FBI agents. Turned out, it was later admitted that that witness was coerced. Poor Bear never even met Leonard Peltier, never knew Leonard Peltier. And now there's actual documentation that exists that shows that the FBI agent, in fact, knew that the testimony and the affidavit was coerced. Uh, but by that time, they had already got him in the United States. And so they moved on with the trial. Mm. So that's one thing. Secondly, at the trial, it became very clear that there was no evidence. There's no, even to this day, there is no physical evidence connecting Leonard Paltier to the killing of those agents. Hmm. You, you have a ballistics expert in the FBI, right? And all they do is run a ballistics shooting, a, a, a pin test, um, and to determine if that exact bullet came out of that exact gun. Well, the ballistics expert that the FBI put on the stand said that that ballistics test was never done. In fact, there was a ballistics test that was done, and the ballistic test proved that, in fact, that bullet did not come from his gun. And that's not all, Nick says. Here was the other unique thing that happened in those cases. The other folks, Dino Butler and Bob Rubidoux, they were tried and they were acquitted of the murdering of these FBI agents based on self-defense. Mm. When Leonard went to jail, they actually got him for aiding and abetting. Well, how do you aid and abet a crime in which other two people were acquitted for? So there was just one thing after another. Since that time, we have seen many people come forth, including Reynolds, who was a former prosecutor, who said, you know, justice needs to be served. That's James Reynolds. He's, he's now called for clemency 
even though he is the former prosecutor. Yep. And that tells you something. You know, Leonard Peltier just turned 79 years old and is the longest living, you know, political prisoner in American history. Leonard Peltier has been in maximum security and sometimes solitary confinement for decades. He also had COVID while in prison, and his communication with the outside world is limited. But Nick is one of the people authorized to speak with him, as you heard at the beginning of the show. They talked the night before I spoke to Nick. I'm on his call list. You get a call and it just says, you know, we accept a call from a federal prison, so you have to say yes. Um, He has 15 minutes maximum. And, you know, he's in bad health. He has diabetes, type 2 diabetes. Mm -hmm. He is, you know, blind in one eye. He has an aortic aneurysm that can get, you know, worse at any time. So there's a lot of health problems. You imagine, you know, anybody on the outside at the age of 79 years old having health problems, the amount of care that they need. Mm -hmm. And he's in a... Eight foot by 12 foot cell with beds in it and a cellmate. You know, it's super damp and cold in those prisons and he is elderly. And he is just trying to hang in there one day at a time. At a big federal prison, they shut everything down. People don't get the proper medical care. People don't get the proper attention that they need, um, even if they're diabetics. It's maddening and it's sad. And when Nick got that call... He says he was actually on the phone with other Native activists planning for his release. I was working with his tribe. I was talking to a logistics meeting because I'm like, we're going to get him out. We are going to fight for Leonard and we're getting him out. And he said he wants to come back home to his people on Turtle Mountain. Let's make that happen. Nick and the members of the tribe are so hopeful about his release They're trying to make a home for Leonard, some place where he can go when he does get out. He don't have nothing. He does not have nothing. That's a big thing for him. He got, you know, he got emotional and was like, I I don't don't know how people have done those kind of things nice for me in my whole life. And he's, it's giving him a hope. And that's what we need for him right now, too. Wow. Is there one thing from your conversation that stands out to you about what he told you? You know, he was just said, you know, one day he's like, I just want to be free. I want to be on my, my own homelands. I want to be amongst my own people. I want to have a home. I want to be able to cook my own food, <laughs> you know. Uh, I want to be able to be surrounded around family and friends, you know. And, uh, yeah, that's like, that's what his request is at this time, you know. Um, and I think that's like the simple things in life, having those things is going to mean the world to him. And that's The Take. This episode was produced by David Enders with Siriyad Khalili, Sonia Bagat, Ashish Malhotra, Amy Walters, Veronisa Campana, Khalid Sultan, Miranda Lynn, Chloe K. Lee, Zainab Bazar, and me, Malika Bilal. Our sound designer is Alex Roldan. Alexandra Locke is The Take's executive producer, and Ney Alvarez is Al Jazeera's head of audio. We'll be back. <laughs>